All right, welcome back to Computer Science E1. My name is David Malin. This is lecture four, the internet. So we have talked briefly, and you've been inundated perhaps on the website with links to podcast this and podcast that. But uh, we're at the point now where on the agenda is to discuss such things as podcasts, which begs the question, what is this podcast that we've been touting? Anyone at all? Great, putting it to good use already, I see. <laughs> Podcasting. All right, would it help if I reminded you that with Problem Set 1 submission comes an opportunity to win this iPod Shuffle and uh, better yet, this iPod T-shirt, which we will distribute at some point over the next week or two once we've graded the problem sets. Anything, podcast. Yes. OK, good. So it certainly refers to, in part, the ability to download audio content and video content in such a way that you can transfer it to something like an iPod Shuffle or a video iPod, or if you're not even familiar with these things, just a little electronic device that's small enough these days to fit on your, in your pocket, on your shoulder while jogging, and so forth. And perhaps podcasting is best explained by just a demonstration of precisely the term. So on E1's website, there's a link in the left-hand menu as well as via this uh, John Harvard statue, if you haven't noticed, who's touting an iPod himself. If you go to that page, you will see just a typical web page in the same style as the rest of the website, but with links to all of this so-called podcasting content. Well, to be clear, the idea of a podcast is not to download the information necessarily through a web page, right? Otherwise, this is just a web page. There's really no need to call it podcasting. But really, if you look at this same content, for instance, through the view of what's called an a uh, podcasting client like iTunes, you'll begin to get a better sense of what this hype is all about. So in fact, if we follow the link on E1's website called subscribe to the feed directly through iTunes, assuming you have iTunes on your computer, you'll see a web page like this, which I brought up briefly in a previous lecture. And essentially, this just shows you exactly the same content. What is this content? Well, as you can sort of see from the small text there, we've been posting, as you probably know, videos of these lectures, audio files in the form of MP3s of these lectures, as well as the TF's fantastic work on these new series, the videos of the week, a couple of which we showed two lectures ago. So what then is a podcast? Well, at the end of the day, it's sort of just a new buzz phrase around a very basic idea that's long been possible on the internet, the distribution of audio, video, and other kinds of content. But it's done technologically in a way that's somewhat new. Specifically, even though you're seeing all of these videos and videos of the week via iTunes, none of that content currently is actually hosted by Apple. None of it is actually hosted by iTunes itself. This is in contrast, for instance, with a lot of the music you buy from iTunes, which presumably is hosted in some sense by Apple itself. Rather, what we did at the start of the year was signed up for an account with Apple for iTunes. They approved us because they do a manual process still these days to sort of moderate the kinds of content that's posted. And what we simply maintain in E1's website is what's called RSS, really simple syndication, or there's other expansions of that acronym. But in short, it is literally just a text file, a text file with a lot of phrases and sentences that describe what is in this so-called podcast. Because at the end of the day, a podcast is just a feed, if you will, of video files and audio files and PDFs, for instance. And we'll actually spend more time in our multimedia lecture on what exactly we mean by MPEG-3s and MPEG-4s and QuickTime movies. But for now, just take it on faith that these are just videos, just audio files. So what we do every week is when we release a new lecture or a new volume of videos of the week, we simply edit this text file with a simple text editor, Microsoft Word or something much simpler, in fact. And all all we do, for instance, to say that we have just released the video for lecture two is the following. We type up this short paragraph. But you'll notice, if you glance closely, even though the text is a little small, that notice that next to a lot of these words are these angled brackets, open bracket, something, close bracket. And those are examples of XML 
elements or tags. And in fact, what you're seeing now is a glimpse, a sneak preview of what you yourself will be typing in just a few weeks' time when we get to the website development aspect of the course. You yourselves will be developing websites, not in XML per se, but in a derivative called XHTML, or perhaps the more familiar term, HTML. Which is the language in which web pages are written. So, suffice,、uh, long story short, every week we update this file. We say what the lecture is called. We give it a bit of a description. We say who gave the lecture, how long the lecture is, and most importantly, we tell iTunes and really anyone else that wants to look at this file. Where the movie file is. And what I've highlighted there is just a URL http colon slash slash www.fas.harvard.edu and so forth. So, really, what a podcast is, from one perspective, is just a big RSS file, an XML file that describes what's in the podcast. And where you can actually go to download the actual content. So, when you actually pull up a site like iTunes or a whole bunch of other programs or so called podcast directories, all you're seeing is one company or one individual's presentation of that material. And if I double click on one of the links provided in iTunes, I'm not downloading the video from iTunes per se, but rather iTunes is directing my computer to where the actual content is. So that it can be copied to my local computer and then subsequently played or transferred to my iPod or equivalent device. Well, E1's podcast is now in its second year. And last year, we would not perhaps have had some of the success that we did, not only with our own local students, but also with reaching other non potential students via the internet.、Um, we were received a good amount of attention from a gentleman that you are about to meet.、Uh, Victor c a j e l o is the host of a podcast called The Typical PC User. Podcast. And we'll post a link on the lectures page after tonight to his own podcast. But this was a gentleman that sought us out after E1 was cited in a number of blogs and news articles for having been among the first courses, at least within Harvard University, to provide students with access to its content via podcast. Victor, given that he does a weekly show about all things related to technology, took an interest in us and was kind enough to invite us onto his radio show. Uh, for a series of interviews and so forth. And so, what we've done is invited him here tonight to speak for just a few minutes about what it is, what it takes for a typical person, if you will, someone like Victor, someone like yourselves, to actually get a podcast of his or her own. Up and running. And to be clear, a podcast does not need to contain video content. It does not need to contain PDFs. In fact, at the very beginning, if you will, podcasts were really just internet based radio shows. But they were radio shows that you didn't really tune into live, but rather someone in their studio or their basement or their living room would record a radio show of sorts using a nice microphone, headset, and so forth, maybe playing music and so forth. They would save that recording. As an MP3, just a computerized audio file, they would post it by, via their own RSS feed so that other people on the internet could download that audio file. So it's a radio show in spirit, but at the end of the day, you're not listening to these things live, you're downloading them and listening to them sort of a la TiVo, but for radio and for other video content. So, with that said, I thought a fun introduction to tonight's lecture on the internet would be to make use of precisely this technological tool of the internet. And one of the up and coming trends, certainly, is this use of not only listening to audio and watching video, but delivering video and delivering audio. So, what I've pulled up here in this small window is a program called Skype. How many of you have ever used Skype before? Anyone? So, two, three people. So, what is Skype? What is this little thing I've pulled up here? Yeah. OK, a y so it's pretty much a telephone in your computer. It, it, it's several things, and that is certainly one of them. One, just to be most familiar perhaps to the audience, it's a program with which you can instant message other people. But that's really just an afterthought with this program because the crux of Skype, the real value out of it, the real feature, is that it does a very good job of allowing you to conduct. Voice over IP or VoIP, V O I P, if you've heard the buzz phrase. And this essentially, as you've said, is just the ability to make phone calls via the internet. What do you need to do that? Well, you need an internet connection, obviously, and dial up、eh, doesn't really work so well these days for something like this, which is fairly bit intensive, but rather something like DSL or cable modems are wonderfully suited to this kind of technology. So in a moment, I'm going to click this big, glaring green button, which is going to dial up Victor, who's sitting in his own. 
office far away, he's going to connect with his own copy of Skype. And using this freely available Skype software, this is going to cost us zero cents a minute, we're going to have an audio phone call with each other. And in fact, though my camera won't be turned on, since it's not so interesting to see me up here yet again, Victor's camera will be on. So you'll actually see this gentleman himself.、Um, the video quality tends never to be as good as the audio. But the wonderful thing, again, about Skype is that, and even I've used this, it's free. And if only for the audio based phone calls, I've spoken with friends of mine in other countries for free. And even with a decent internet connection, it sounds just as good, if not better, sometimes than telephones. But it certainly depends on your connection. And I will say, we're going to use this you know, 50 cent microphone here tonight, since, and this will actually probably suffice. We're going to use the speakers built into the lecture hall. But typically, and the only downside to using software like this is that, one, you need a microphone. And you need speakers. At least you have the latter usually with your computer. But the problem, at least for neophytes, when it comes to using this sort of stuff, if you have a desktop computer that has usually two speakers sitting right here, and you have a microphone, however cheap or expensive, <coughs> if you keep that microphone too close to the speakers, what's going to happen? Okay, you're going to get really annoying feedback or that really high pitched screech if it's even close enough. And that's the only logistical issue to work out that can at least initially be sort of enough of an impediment to even bother with the technology. But for 10, 20, or more bucks, you can actually get little headsets, which, if you're embarrassed to wear them on the street, you can at least wear them in the privacy of your own home. And that gives you really high quality audio back and forth. So, with that said, let's dial up Victor and ask him just what it takes for someone like him or someone like you to go about. Presenting your own podcast. Hello. Hi, Victor, can you hear me? Yeah, dude, how are you? I am well. Good to see you. This is working well, it seems. I've just put up your video, and we have your audio going through the lecture hall here. Well, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Well, Victor, I've given a quick introduction, but、uh, one question first. Where are you geographically right now? I'm located in beautiful Southern California, where it's still warm. Well, fantastic. This is actually a really good connection. So, if you would, why don't、um, you tell us a bit about your experience podcasting, what it would take for folks like these to get up and going with their own podcast? And then, if you don't mind, I can try to relay a couple of questions if they come up. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks for inviting me. So, it's all about content first, you guys. Podcasting is one of those phenomena in new media that means that you and I have a voice and we can let people know about what we're passionate about. Whether it's journalism, non copyrighted music, comedy, couple cast, or just computers, like in my case, there is no formula today for creating a successful podcast. It's about all of us telling our stories. So, the first thing you need is good content and a good story to tell. Once you have that, The rest of it is just simple technology. So let's talk about what that looks like. You're going to need some kind of a platform to record your podcast, primarily your computer. You can start with something simple like this headset mic. You can buy one of these for $10 to $20. And you can use something like that to record your audio onto the microphone, or even a USB type mic like this sounds in here, which is like $80, which you can plug directly into a PC or a Mac. So that's the first thing, a microphone. Then you need some kind of a sound card, and most of our computers today have a sound card, so that makes it very easy. Now you need a way to record the sound onto your computer. If you have a Macintosh, GarageBand has built in capabilities to record your voice, so you're all set. But no matter what platform you have, one of the most favorite applications for podcasters is called Audacity, and it is an open source. Cross platform application that lets you mix together the sound of your voice, some music, some sound effects, and then combine all of those into a podcast as an MP3 format file. So if you record your voice, you mix those elements, you save the file as a MP3, and now you have your content ready to put somewhere for people to listen to. This then brings us to kind of the next step of it is how do you get your information from your hands or your computer out into the internet?、And、the way that you do that is that you need to get yourself a hosting provider or a blog provider. So, just like in blogging, where you're writing down your journals or your news stories and so on, 
There are providers that are giving podcasters now the ability to save those MP3 files and upload them to their servers, as well as it's a place for you to put your show notes, and they will provide you with those services for no money. For example, switchpod.com. trouble of hosting your files and keep telling people where to go get them. They take care of that all for you. You don't have to worry about running out of bandwidth because too many people have heard your show. So it's a, it was a big problem at first because people didn't have enough bandwidth, but people like Libsyn and SwitchPod have come to the rescue for very little money. So now we have our content, we have our place that we have put that content, and now we need to publish the show, put it out on the internet so that people can go to a URL and they can either listen to it right from the website or they can download it by using a podcatcher. I don't know if David talked to you about those, but programs like iTunes or like Juice that lets you go and they look at that RSS feed and they say, oh, Victor has a new show up there. I subscribe to it go down and grab that show from that server. And so now once you have posted that podcast and made it available to the world, now it's up to you to do what I call the last part of podcasting, which is promoting your podcast. And this is an area where you're going to have a lot of different opinions. At first I would say promote it with your friends and family. After all, they are the kindest to us and they'll let us uh, know what you're doing well. And it takes a while just to get used to being Kind of microphone. I mean, we're not media professionals. We didn't come from the newsrooms of America. We're just people that are talking. Some people do their podcasts live, stream of consciousness, and don't do any editing. Other people, like me, do editing and add music and sound effects and things that give it a more uh, polished uh, preference. But it is purely a preference that way. So I would let your family members and your friends know about it first. Give them the URL. Have them listen to it, make sure that you can download it, and then, and only then, should you really go out and promote your podcast to the world. And the way that you do that is that you let podcasting directories know you're there. I'm going to give you three major ones, although there are now literally hundreds. The iTunes Music Store, which we're all probably familiar with, they'll be happy to review your content. You give them the name of your show, and where the RSS feed is located, and they simply go and review that, and unless the content is questionable, you're usually in their directory within about a week, and then you can tell your friends to look for you and your show within iTunes. There are also PodcastAlley.com and PodcastPickle.com. Those are two of the biggest directories, and those are places where you and I as listeners can go and look for podcasts on all kinds of content. And believe me, there's lots of content. Matter of fact, there are not one, but two different podcasting on curling and on uh, knitting. So you can imagine that anything you want to look for is out there. So once you have your show, simply put it in those directories and people will find you. Now, if you're looking for uh, to be a star or to get rich on podcasting, this is probably not the time to be the one of those. I think I've heard that uh, more than Less than 10% of all podcasts have more than 100 people listening or subscribed to the podcast. So it is one of those mediums that is described without a long tail phenomenon, which says that there are lots of people listening, but there may only be a very few listening to your specific type of show because of their preferences. So do it for the passion. Do it because you want to get the message out. In my case, my shows deal with the typical PC user podcast, teaches people how to use PCs, Typical Mac user is for people like me who just switched to a Mac a year ago, so I'm learning and I'm teaching. And then my other podcast is called Integration Tales, where I tell people stories about integrating from one country to another. Those are all about passion for me. Yes, I have a few listeners in some of them, but I only have that because I put a product out that I'm passionate about. And even if I have 100 listeners, I will still do it. So it really becomes, at the end of the day, creating your content, 
publishing your podcast and show notes, promoting your content, and then rinse and repeat. Uh, maybe I hope I didn't go too quickly, but I think that's a that's the whole line now. No, not at all. That was fantastic. Would you mind fielding any questions if some hands go up here? I'd be happy to. All right. So I'll be the one to stand here awkwardly and look for the hands. Yes. Thank you, Victor. What do you see as the future of video podcasting? Thank you, Victor. What do you see as the future of video podcasting is the question. Ah, well, that is a huge future. Now, the thing with video is that there are some wonderful examples of video podcasts right now is that the complexity is quite a bit more. Okay. There are a lot of fun to watch, and uh, Ask a Ninja is out there, and uh, you have other shows uh, that, are, that are out there, Rocket Boom, for example. But the editing process and the time that it takes to make those is a lot, it's a lot steeper curve. So I see that there will be uh, both that will look more like traditional media, but I don't see it being as um, heavily geared towards people like you and me who can buy a $10 microphone and get our message out. And that's what new media to me is about. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. As someone new to podcasting, it doesn't seem like you could put a podcast out and get a large audience or get even really a significant audience right off. Is there really a huge demand out there for, for podcasts of all kinds? So as someone starting off his or her own podcast for the first time, is there really demand out there for, say, one lone individual's podcast or for these podcasts in general? Well, demand is a funny word in podcasting. Um, you'd be surprised. There are some shows that take off for uh, unknown reasons. There's a wonderful couple show, for example, called Keith and the Girl. And they are kind of R-rated. But they got going in New York, and before you knew it, they had a massive audience. And, and now they do. So as a new podcaster, what you need to do is get yourself into the podcasting community from within. If you listen to podcasts, send them out an email and say, hey, I have this new show about photography. Would you mind playing a promo from my show on your show that have a lot of people? And so from the inside, we kind of get to know each other. We go into forums and into bulletin boards, and the podcasting community kind of um, organically grows. If you have good content, people will come to the show. One more question. Is there a possibility for podcasting generating is there a possibility for podcasting generating income in the future? Well, I sure hope so. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, I think that there is. People are generating income with podcasts today. There are plenty of podcasts out there today that have eight to nine million downloads a month and that are starting to generate some uh, dollars. But I think for the majority of people, that is the great unanswered question of podcasting is how do we turn the podcasting model and marry it with a more traditional media advertising model in a way where uh, some people will make money and most people will be okay with maybe just paying for their hosting cost every month, that 10 to $30 a month. So right now, that's the big question in podcasting, and I'm looking for that answer to you. Well, Victor, thanks so much for joining us today. We'll be sure to post some links to your podcast on the course's website after tonight. It's been my pleasure, and uh, thank you for having me. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Only because we have the window up now, and this might be somewhat anticlimactic rather than having audio and video up there, but one of the neat things you can do with Skype as well today is if you pull up this little button here, you'll see something quite similar to a telephone keypad. And in fact, uh, let's see, am I allowed to type in this number or should I use a different one? That's OK? OK. Um, if we go ahead and type, uh, how do I? Oh, wait, can I do this? Call. Oh, no. Our, for, OK, so as of a few weeks ago, you were able to do this completely for free. And you were able to call landline phones using Skype. And I was doing this briefly, or at least a friend of mine was doing this briefly and calling me all of the time from Skype because it was entirely free. And he was in California, thus avoiding the long distance. I do realize now and remember that they've turned back on the feature. It's still incredibly cheap. And in fact, I used Skype to talk with friends when I was in Argentina for a week because it was pennies per minute as opposed to dollars per minute using an actual landline phone. And again, you certainly have to contend sometimes with quality issues and you want to have a decent enough setup so that you're not getting feedback, but it certainly is a wonderful alternative. And the upside of Skype now charging us is that I will not reveal Ray's personal cell phone number to everyone on the podcast. <laughs> um, but know that that is an option and that's one of the ways that 
Skype aspires to make some money. And also, Leo, in part answer to your question about making money off of these things, we can perhaps, those inspiring entrepreneurs among you, take some comfort in that you can even start a huge video-focused business that doesn't make money, e.g. Uh, YouTube, and still uh, sell yourselves to the tune of $1.6 billion as of this past week. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's quite true. And just to summarize, I mean, there have long been a number of services, and especially these days, ever since the dot-com era, where you get the same idea, the same technology has been around for years, but all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you start to get critical mass around some product or around some website, and there's just huge valuations put on these things, YouTube being an example of one of them. And long story short, if you're not familiar, YouTube is just a video sharing website. You sign up for a free account, you upload your own personal videos that maybe you took with your little digital camera or shot with your uh, regular camcorder and then digitized, and it's really just to share videos with people. And it's become incredibly popular, and Google Google for one sees upwards of $1.6 billion of value in this. I will say to play the other side of the coin and devil's advocate, if you will, I think only time will tell if a lot of these ideas and a lot of these technologies and a lot of the sites are worth the valuations that are being put on them. And one might argue that even what's happening in the past couple of years with a lot of the prices that are being tacked onto MySpace and YouTube and Facebook and so forth, it almost makes me wonder sometimes if people have already forgotten the lessons of 1999, 2000, and so when it seems like there was similar money being thrown around. But even then, time will tell. That is a perfect segue to a video that Dan brought to our attention. You will recall a couple weeks ago we passed around a hard drive, both one closed and one open, and we showed our own animation of what goes on inside of a hard drive, what Dan found on YouTube. And if you're wondering what YouTube is, this is YouTube. So this is just a site where you're able to share and watch and, and play videos. This is a video that someone made rather delicately by taking the lid off of their hard drive, but a working hard drive that was still physically connected to a computer. They just physically removed it from the box, but they left the ribbon cable connected. And you'll see what exactly is going on inside of a hard drive when it is actually running in your computer. It's just a minute or so long here. So here we go. See if I can make it a little bigger for us. If you've ever wondered what that sound is, or that sound. This is why they have lids. They very quickly become uninteresting. But you see what's going on inside the drive. But that was sort of a lot of activity and a lot of noise for deleting a folder. What do you think explains the relative length of that process of deleting a folder? That would seem to be a pretty atomic operation. OK, perhaps finding the folder, seeking to the folder. It looked like the reading head was doing a lot of back and forth, though, which would almost suggest that it didn't find the folder, but it probably did. Why else, then, might it have been toggling back and forth so much? It may have been uh, there could have been information uh, on different parts of the disk. The folder itself might have been fragmented. In an implementation sense, folders themselves don't really require a lot of storage space because they can be represented rather efficiently. But what sometimes is inside of folders? 
Easy question. Yeah, so in this case, and as the gentleman I think explains in the comments accompanying this video, there were actually a whole lot of files in that folder, which explained for whatever operating system he was using that it was recursively going through and deleting those files and maybe other folders as well. So we'll put a link to this on the course's website as well if you'd like to take a look or at YouTube in general.、Um, and it's worth noting too, just to tie in our first two discussions of hardware with tonight, the internet, and also to play off of some of the things Victor said. In addition to this podcast being available to students via iTunes, it's available to really anyone with iTunes.、Um, at least some of the lecture content and this year the videos of the week content. What the teaching staff and I spent last week struggling with was the load that was apparently being placed on this podcast this year.、Um, based on our These answers tonight to what is a podcast and the deafening silence that accompanied it, I can only hypothesize that it was other people who were downloading the podcast this past week. But long story short,、um, thanks to those individuals who have subscribed, really, thank you,、um, we crippled one of the Extension School servers early last week such that I got a nice email effectively explaining that we'd been booted from the server that all other courses use at the Extension School. So that we induced a last minute scramble. We then contracted with a, an outside third party host. A company called DreamHost that you will see later in the semester because we'll use them for you, the students, when you develop your own personal websites with your own personal domain name. But at DreamHost, we signed up for a relatively inexpensive plan that gave us plenty of disk space. It's you know, a few tens of gigabytes, maybe a hundred or more gigabytes, but storage problems are not what we have. But it did offer us 1.6 terabytes of transfer or of bandwidth. That is to say, we were allowed, according to this plan, over the course of a month, 30 days, this is what our contract allowed, to have people on the internet, wherever they are, download up to 1.6 terabytes of information. Now, none of our E1 videos are nearly that huge. The biggest file is maybe 250 megabytes. Well, what's one order of magnitude larger than a gigabyte? Damn, a megabyte <laughs> is a gigabyte. Well, what comes after gigabyte? Terabytes. So, tera essentially denotes what numeric value? Trillion. So, you're familiar with megabytes in terms of floppy disk, 1.4. That's exactly what we did the first lecture, too. 1.4 megabytes. You're familiar with、uh, hard drives that you have, which have 20, maybe 400 gigabytes. Imagine now having access then, or the ability to let people on the internet download 1.6 terabytes. Of information, over 1,000 gigabytes of information. Well, we got a nice note from DreamHost、um, four days into our contract explaining that in the first four of 30 days of the month, we had used 1.4 of our 1.6 terabytes. And just like the cell phone companies today do, they'll charge you if you go every gigabyte over.、Um, and you know, if you've ever gotten a $300 cell phone bill, that the overage costs tend to be high. So、uh, I passed along to the extension score our estimated bill of $6,000. Dollars for the first month of our free podcast that we don't charge for, mind you.、Um, so we quickly upped the plan to a four terabyte plan,、um, now an eight terabyte plan, which should hold us over.、Um, but again, thank you, all of you, for tuning in remotely. It's been a wonderful challenge. But this is honestly the first semester in 11 terms of teaching this class that I think we've even spent more than a split second even using the term terabyte. And it's sort of a fascinating thing, just technologically these days, to now be getting into these kinds of numbers. So it's,、uh, only a geek can perhaps really take pleasure in that idea. But、um, it's amazing what's happening. And it is ideas and technologies and websites like YouTube that are really driving some of this growth in data storage requirements. I mean, a typical video that's uploaded for E1 is between 25 and 250 megabytes. Contrast that with one MP3 of a song that, for instance, you might have downloaded back in the day from Napster or these days from iTunes itself, three megabytes. Four megabytes. So, when you start talking about distributing 200 megabyte video files, you start to deal with a lot of interesting server side issues. And that's precisely what we coped with this past week. So, more on those kinds of things in the future. For now, let's dive into the topic that we've skirted over up until now, which is quite simply well, the internet, what is it? Well, I'll turn it over to you since my first question of the night went over so well. What is the internet? 
this is our clip, but you'll see that the slides in this class, because we have notes and because I like things to stay rather dynamic and not follow a script, I mean, slides can't really get fluffier than this, right? A guy surfing the internet. So we'll use this for 10 or so minutes while we talk about the internet. What is the internet? Yeah. It's a series of tubes. It's not a truck. None of you are familiar with the quote that uh, Senator watch John Stewart and it comes up every other night. So um, watch John Stewart and that little joke will make sense. So what is the internet? For real? Yeah. A large series of servers, routers, et cetera, that send information all over the world. Yeah. So it's a large infrastructure of servers and routers and just really computers that are interconnected somehow all over the world. It is the network of networks. And even if you're not particularly the technophile and are still taking this class, you probably have an idea already that a network is simply a bunch of computers connected together. Well, how that's done and what kinds of technologies you can use to connect those computers together will be one of the foci for tonight as well as next week's lecture. But for today, we focus more on mostly the higher level details. What is the internet? What can you do with the internet? And in our continuation of this lecture next week, we'll dive down deeper and look underneath the hood, so to speak, at how it all actually works on a more tech, uh, technological level. But let's, for tonight, first start off with a couple of softballs. So what is a domain? You've probably heard this term, but give me a definition for it in layman's terms. What's a domain? Yeah, so it's an address of sorts, right? Like you've probably said out loud CNN.com before or Harvard.edu before. Well, that's just a domain. It is sort of an English-like phrase that describes some kind of network of computers, and a network of computers that's usually geographically related. Right? It's pretty reasonable to assume that all of the computers related to harvard.edu are kind of sort of in the same area, though that doesn't need to be the case technologically. Well, let's actually take a step back then, because if we're already getting ahead of ourselves, if we're already talking about the internet before talking about its basic building blocks, well, this is easy. Right? We talked about this in our first couple of lectures. Here is a computer that you can tell even the course becomes dated when computers don't really look even like that anymore, right? And that's kind of sad. But this is a monitor from yesteryear on top of a desktop from yesteryear. I'm not very good with drawing LCD, so we'll stick with this version. Add two computers to the picture, connect them somehow with some kind of wire, who cares what? What do you got? You've got a network. This kind of network might simply be called a peer to peer network. Well, why? Well, you might guess because you have two peers, two equivalent types of computers, somehow communicating with each other. A peer-to-peer -peer network can also involve many, many other computers. Napster and its infrastructure was, in a sense, a peer-to-peer -peer network because all of these peers, all of these individual consumer PCs, were eventually connected to one another, albeit through a central server. So that was peer-to-peer -peer in a sense, but software today that's particularly used for file sharing are more peer-to-peer in this sort of sense. And I'm not going to draw hundreds of computers on the board here, but if you can imagine a network of a whole bunch of computers really arranged in an ad hoc fashion where some computers might have direct connections with one another, some can only talk to other computers through other computers, that's a peer-to-peer -peer network as it's usually understood today. It's sort of an ad hoc network that's formed using various types of internet connections. And though I draw them with lines here, I don't mean that these two computers are physically connected. I just mean that they have some kind of internet-based connection. They could be in completely different states or countries. The lines just represent software type connections, network connections. Well, with that said, let's actually go to a more common scenario, at least consistent with the types of networks you use each day. If I all of a sudden, and just for the sake of dramatization, draw one of these computers as relatively bigger, just because it's stronger, more powerful, it's got more RAM, it's got a better CPU. Well, I'm going to call this thing, in this context, a server. And meanwhile, I'm going to call the thing on the left what? A CPU, but in this context, you might have heard the phrase, or the word LAN would describe the whole thing. We'll come back to that in a second. But what I'm looking for is the relationship between this server and what might be called a client. Computer. So if you've ever heard the phrase a client-server relationship, or really you just hear these words tossed around, a server, a client, it's pretty much just like what happens in 
a restaurant. You sort of have one guy who's running the show, the waiter or the server. He will answer your requests or will provide you with information or really food that you, the client, ask for. And this is terribly representative of how most internet-based applications work today. For instance, you sit down at your computer and you pull up Internet Explorer and you type in CNN.com. You in that context are acting as what's called a client. And you're making some kind of request over the internet. We'll expose the inner workings next week to CNN.com, which is obviously the server in this case. CNN.com server or servers looks at whatever request you've sent, and that request is going to be along the lines of give me your main page, your home page. The server is going to grab that home page or generate it and then just reply just as you've received your dish at the restaurant. And it's precisely that relationship, sort of a subservient relationship, where the client asks the server for something and gets something back. That sort of captures, in fact, what we were doing with Skype just now, albeit only one side of it. When we dialed up Victor, the way that Skype and programs like it tend to work is clearly there's a server in the middle, because even I personally had no idea where in the US at the moment Victor was. Apparently he was in California. Well, if I wanted to make a direct connection, like a peer-to-peer -peer connection to his computer, well, that's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. How do I contact Victor if I don't know where I should contact him? And so that's why a lot of technologies, a lot of websites, a lot of software products use central servers. So in effect, what happened when I double clicked on Skype on my computer, well, my version of Skype made a connection to the server. And it wasn't just this one-time request response. It rather is a persistent connection, like calling up Skype's main server on the phone and just maintaining an open connection. Technology is different, but the spirit is the same. Meanwhile, guess what happened over here? Well, if this is Victor's client, it too made some kind of connection to Skype's server. Skype now knows where David is. Skype now knows where Victor is. And Skype's server can effectively put us to in contact with one another. How many of you use AOL Instant Messenger? Pretty much the same exact design for that. right? When you sign on to AOL Instant Messenger, you're running a little client on your computer. It connects to AIM's main server, which is called, uh, I think, oscar.aol.com is the host name, the address they use for it, something like that. And then your friends connect to AIM's server as well. And then all of you can instant message each other because you're all using AOL Instant Messenger server as an intermediary. Now, this sort of implies what about the privacy of your instant messages? <laughs> Not very, right? Literally, all of your instant messages, for the most part, go through AOL instant messengers and AOL's main servers, which certainly means they can do what with them if they so chose? Read them, certainly. Store them in perpetuity, certainly. It's really up to them. Whether they do this, I don't know. But this is certainly an issue when it comes to, say, um, current proposed legislation, which I think we touched upon briefly in lecture one or two, where ISPs, which are not AOL Instant Messenger per se, but your ISPs can certainly look at all of the emails and all of the web pages that you're accessing from your computer. Right? After all, who, who do you use to connect to the internet these days? Anyone? Comcast. So if your computer, in that sense, is the client, and you're using Comcast servers to access the internet, well, that suggests that they, in that case, are the intermediary between you and everyone on the internet. Now, for the most part, ISPs don't retain data. They don't retain data on what websites you visited and what emails you've sent, or the content, at least, of them, just because eh, it's sort of more legal trouble than it's worth if they're not required. It just costs money to store this data. And what do they really need it for? They maintain logs of that you sent an email, likely, and maybe who it was to, but usually not the content. But if you pay attention to current media goings on, one of the proposals from at least this country's government is that they want to keep around information for at least three months, six months. And this is a huge deal for the ISPs and others because it's just expensive, if nothing else. And never mind all of the civil liberties issues that it might raise. So with that said, back to technology, we have these two basic relationships, either a client-server relationship or sort of a tiered model where you have multiple clients connecting to a central server. Now consider what Victor and I, and when we were doing, we were transmitting not only audio, but video as well. Now what do we already know from our brief chat about podcasting that's implied by the distribution of video in general? Sort of a leading question, but 
which, let's all make it more frank, which is, which costs more in terms of space to send a little AOL instant message like a smiley face or to send your smiley face over the internet? All right, so your smiley face in the form of a video. So if all of a sudden these very popular services like Skype and AOL Instant Messenger are using these centralized server models, you would think this quickly becomes problematic, especially for video. Right? Consider the issue of our podcast. We had one central server originally at the extension school, and it was just serving content to clients. It was not even serving as an intermediary to other clients. Well, now imagine Skype. Do you think that Skype routes all of our audio and all of our video content through Skype server? Does AOL Instant Messenger do that when you do a direct connection, quote unquote, and send someone a really big file or a really big image? Well, in theory, no. And ideally, no, because what the server simply does as I sort of suggested in the voiceover, is it informs this client and this client how they can directly contact each other and thereby circumvent the intermediary because once the servers put those two clients in touch, eh, what do you really need him for after that? Now that's a slight simplification because that is actually problematic these days because how many of you with your DSL or cable modem connections have um, home routers or firewalls? If you know what that, how many of you have not only your modem plugged into your cable line, but also a black or blue box that lets you share your internet connection among multiple computers in your house? Well, if you have one of those things, more hands are going up, and we'll come back to this either tonight or next week. You are sharing your one, um, your one pipe to the internet among multiple computers, but the effect of that usually is to create the appearance that even though your home might have 10 computers in it or three computers in it, to the outside world, it looks like there's just one of you. Because I, Comcast only presents you with, we'll get back to this, one IP address, as it's called, one means of addressing your computer. This is a problem, though, because if Skype knows where you're coming from and Skype knows where Victor's coming from, well, suppose that Victor's on a network with a whole bunch of other people. And suppose that I'm on a network with a whole bunch of other people. In other words, we might be sharing our internet connections. For purposes now, realize, or at least get a sense of the fact that the server can't necessarily put two people in touch with each other that are behind these so-called routers or firewalls. For reasons we'll get back to, but this is why if you've ever tried with MSN Messenger or AOL Instant Messenger to do audio conferencing or do video conferencing, it usually doesn't work. Those programs are not nearly as good as Skype is and as, say, Google Talk is these days at using various tricks to get around those kinds of issues. And we'll come back to that in more technical detail in a bit. But if you've ever tried, and you can try it tonight, try to initiate a voice or video connection with someone with AOL Instant Messenger or MSN Messenger. If either of you are behind one of these home routers, odds are it will not work, as well as at least Skype and Google Talk do it. But more on that in a bit. So you've got a couple of computers connected via cables. You've got now a, let's do it this way. You've got not just a server here, but you've got a whole bunch of computers in your home, as you were just saying, and all of these guys want to connect to the internet. Well, it stands to reason that if you want to connect multiple computers together and not just two, you need to wire them not necessarily to each other, but to some central point. And as soon as you start connecting multiple computers together using whatever kind of technology, maybe you put all of these computers inside of a very oddly shaped building, as suggested by this rectangle in the door, well, what do you then have? You have now what was described earlier as a, a LAN. So from the beginning, a computer, you know what it is. A peer-to-peer -peer network is just a, two computers connected together. A LAN is multiple computers connected together. And they are usually very geographically proximal to one another. So that's why I drew this very goofy looking building, just to suggest that if you have a whole bunch of computers connected together in some very tight space, like a building, or maybe even a city block, the general term for, to describe that would be a LAN. Contrast this with something you might have heard more so perhaps in years past, but a WAN. Well, what does LAN stand for? 
local area network, right? The acronym pretty much explains what it is. It's just a very somewhat vague term. It doesn't have any minimum number of computers you're, you have to have. It doesn't have any maximum number of computers. It's a general term you can whip out to describe a bunch of computers connected together that are sort of related to one another because they're in the same building or maybe because they're physically all connected to the same central device. A WAN, by contrast, wide area network. It's just more than that. You, maybe you have a WAN, for argument's sake, when you have a building here and a building here, and you connect those buildings together via some kind of cable, then you might say, all right, now that's a WAN, because it's spanning multiple LANs. So you have a computer, you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, you have a LAN, maybe you have a WAN. What do you get when you connect all of these LANs or WANs together somehow or other? A uh, network, yes. But you get the network, if you will. You get the internet. And that's why I introduced this as the internet being the network of networks. You can take it one step further. The internet is the network of networks of networks of networks. It's sort of the uber network to which the entire world, at least the, with networks, is interconnected these days. So then what is a domain? Well, a domain is just a way of describing a LAN or a WAN or a bunch of LANs or WANs. There's really no hard and fast rules around any of these. Atop there, I've put a domain of harvard.edu. Well, that is just the name given to describe all of the computers you know, on Harvard's campus. At right, there's a column called subdomains. Well, sometimes, if only for administrative um, simplicity, it's nice to sort of organize your own network, your own WAN, your own domain, into hierarchies with different people perhaps administering different parts of the university or of the company. And so you have the ability on the internet to describe computers not only by their domain name, but by subdomains. For instance, how many of you already have a FAS account? OK, so about half of you. And if you don't already, the current problem set uh, charges you with obtaining one, or the previous one does. If you have an email address of the form mailin at fas.harvard.edu, your domain name is generally called harvard.edu, and your subdomain is fas.harvard.edu. How many of you have an email address in harvard.edu? OK, so many of you as well. So if you have that address, how many of you have a at harvard.edu address where your first name is something like, not quite like this, but capital David underscore capital mailin? Something like that. Well, Harvard does that in its domain name. It'll give you David underscore Malin at harvard.edu, but most of you probably then have more local departmental accounts that David underscore Malin at harvard.edu is just a so-called alias to. And this is just one way that Harvard administratively and technologically keeps things nice and separate for different people to administer. What's another example of a website or an entity with subdomains? Anything come to mind? Anything at all. What about Craigslist? So in a sense, you've seen something. If you go to www.craigslist.org, what city's listings do you get? San Francisco's, in fact, which is their default website. If you go to boss, B-O-S, .craigslist.org, you get instead Boston's listings. But it turns out, in that case, B-O-S is something called a host name, which looks sort of like a subdomain, but it's a little different. So Let's, let's take a look here. If we, let's take a look a little bit more at these subdomains, and we'll see where the technological relevance comes. Here's a whole bunch of suffixes, many of which you're probably familiar with. All right, what looks immediately familiar on this list besides dot com, dot gov, dot edu, dot net, and then there's a bunch of others, some of which do already exist, some of which have been proposed to exist. Perhaps the latter one on the far right gets the most attention in the media these days. But these are all what are called top level domains. Right? So we did this little exercise on the board to sort of give us the basic building blocks of what a network is and what a network of networks is. Well, the means by which you describe networks is by domain names, part of which is this so-called top level domain. In CNN.com, inferring from these mere descriptions alone, what is the TLD or top level domain of CNN.com? Dot, what was it? Dot com. Dot com. This is just a generic way, a general way of saying that CNN's domain is generally speaking 
commercial. If by contrast you visit www.whitehouse.gov, what does its TLD imply? Again, a, sort of an easy question. It's somehow government related. And in fact, until a couple years ago, if uh, you ever made the mistake of visiting www.whitehouse.com, <laughs> at least one of us has been there, um, you would have seen a very different website than the one currently presented by the Bush administration. Uh, if you Google around for it, I don't think it's still active, but you'll perhaps find screenshot. Or actually, if you're really curious, you can probably go to um, Go, uh, search Google search for I don't know why I'm promoting this. Search go to the Google search for the Wayback Machine. Just I'll show you this website, but we won't actually use it. If you go to Wayback Machine, whose URL I never quite remember. So there's this website which is wonderfully interesting, if not a little scary. Um, Archive, what is it? What's the domain here? Archive.org, the Wayback Machine. This is essentially a service that works to varying degrees of success that has been over the years archiving websites. And it's sort of embarrassing. You can scroll back in time and see like my college website and my terribly limited HTML skills at the time. I think you can find old versions of E1's website from years ago. And I don't know, I'll leave this as an at home. Uh, uh, unendorsed home exercise, if you look up www.whitehouse.com, you might see old um, versions of that website as well. Or at least if you Google around, I'm sure people talked about what it was all about. Those of you who have no clue, um, well, just ask the person next to you, because enough people seem to know what's going on right now. Anyhow, TLDs are meant to organize hierarchically domain names in a way that gives you a sense of what kind of domain it is. Are there restrictions? If you, the user, want to go and buy a domain name in .net, .org, or .com these days? What kind of entity must you be to buy a .org, .net, or .com? Yeah. A business for .com? Ideally, that was certainly the original purpose. But it turns out these days, no restrictions on any of those three. So you can have .coms, you can have .nets, .orgs owned by anyone. Which one you choose is really a matter of choice, but really a matter of availability. Um, as you will see when we get to the website development part of this course, choosing a domain name, at least one you want, is a non-trivial matter. One, a lot of good names have been taken up by actual websites and companies. Two, a lot more domain names have been, perhaps been taken up by squatters, folks who have just bought these domain names, like uh, thinking that someday someone will come knocking and want to pay them more than the $7 a year or so it's costing them to maintain it, hoping to cash in on the $1,000 domain name or the million dollar domain name or even something more than that. So you will perhaps feel that frustration when you seek out your own domain name. But turns out among the TLDs you can choose from these today are many. One of the best registrars that I've used in my experience to register a domain name is GoDaddy. It's a goofy name and the website's kind of overwhelming because they try to upsell you every time you visit a page. But if you sort of ignore all of the upsells and just seek out your 695 or 895 domain name, you can get a good deal and they have a very good interface for managing domain names you might own. And again, we'll come back to this in our website lecture, but for tonight, I just wanted to show you the drop down. If the name is available, you are allowed these days to register a website in any of these TLDs. And more than these, in fact. GoDaddy doesn't necessarily um, allow for, doesn't necessarily let you register all the available ones. But if you want to host, you know, davidmalin.jp, if it's available, you can create the illusion, in effect, by name that your website is in Japan. This is only to say that TLDs, though originally intended to create very obvious hierarchies, very obvious distinctions, has begun to relax somewhat. Each country gets to manage its own domain. And in fact, if you've ever been to something like, um, uh, what's a website that uses it? Anything that ends in .tv. Have you ever been to a website ending in .tv? Well, .tv is the domain name that belongs to a little uh, Southeast Pacific uh, country that decided to sell off the rights effectively to its domain name because, at least in the English-speaking world, .tv can perhaps fetch a pretty price for TV shows, if nothing else. So I'll leave that as a uh, more uh, family-friendly at-home exercise if you'd like to figure out what country it is that allows you to register names in the .tv TLD. Uh, hand went up earlier. Mm -hmm. And very interesting question. Many websites these days don't even have the www anymore. In fact, if I go to CNN.com, I will get the day's news. If I go to, and I stopped that intentionally because 
I always say CNN.com because it's such a short domain name to type during lecture, but I've made the mistake for years of pulling up the current events on the news and then all interest goes up there. So we won't see what's going on in the world now. But if we go to GoDaddy.com, it's probably going to pull up www.GoDaddy.com. If I pull up just Craigslist.org, it too will, oh, whoops. If I pull up, well, let's do, uh, uh, what do we do? CNN.com. If we pull up instead www.godaddy.com, well, that too works. Well, long story short, back in the, or the days of when the internet was first becoming popularized, you would often see URLs described as http colon slash slash www.cnn.com. Well, the world relatively quickly acclimated to the fact that OK, I know that this means go on the internet. So gradually, you saw HTTP colon slash slash being dropped. What that is, we'll come back to in this course. And so you just saw www.cnn.com. Well, that's sort of a mouthful. And even that's www is sort of becoming gratuitous today. Because if you see .com, you know, unless you have not been paying attention for several years, you know what that means and what that is. So the www has been dropped. And technologically, it is very easy for you to set up a website that either uses www or doesn't use it. And what good, well-managed websites do these days is they let you visit both, and they'll usually route you to the same location. And just like what happened with GoDaddy, if GoDaddy just likes to present itself to the world as www.godaddy.com, they'll use a server-side trick to just change the URL on you, just so that they present some unified marketing, fa um, in, uh, marketing face. If you visit a website or try to visit a website like davidmalin.com and hit Enter, and it just doesn't work, even though www.davidmalin.com does work, frankly, that's just a stupid decision by the administrators of the website, because it appears that the site's broken when really they haven't flipped a switch that makes the uh, version of the URL work without the www. And in fact, on that note, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break, and when we resume, we will dive in deeper. OK, so we have our basic building blocks tonight of what a network is. It's a bunch of computers connected together. You can describe a bunch of computers connected together by way of a domain name, so harvard.edu. But let's actually consider what some of these components are so that some of these matters like, do you need the www, do you not need it, start to make a bit more intuitive sense. If I write down something like www.cnn.com, again, softball, this is the part I've underlined is the top level domain, the TLD. Right? And in general, it's a hint as to what kind of website it is. Though to be clear earlier, even though you can choose a website these days in .org, .net, or .com, I would wager that to this day the most popular is .com. If only because, at least for those individuals who don't really appreciate that it doesn't matter for the most part what your TLD is these days. They think they see .com, they think website. They see .net, .org might not necessarily be as clear to the person off the street that that is, for instance, a website they should visit. But I would argue that even that potential confusion is going away in time. Um, so this is generally called the domain name. This is called the host name. If you're talking about the address of a website, it's usually broken up into the host name and the domain name, part of which is the TLD. But it is certainly possible for a website to only have this part, which means that it effectively has no host name, which is to say when you visit CNN.com, the server configuration is such that it just routes you to a computer that is nameless in a sense, but is in effect CNN's web server. Or the server can simply add that www and just make more explicit the host name. Well, what do we even mean by host name? Well, how many servers do you think CNN has? So they typically have a lot. Any of these big websites, they don't just have one big server as I drew it on the board today. They have a lot of smaller but very fast, if not very inexpensive servers. Google works in this way, but with thousands of computers. But you don't have to know the name of the Google server that you happen to be searching on. You just go to google.com or www.google.com. And through various server-side configuration tricks, when you go to google.com, your search query for whatever it is you're searching can be 
be routed randomly or in some special fashion to one of these computers. Well, computers like people tend to have names so that you can refer to them and say, oh, the Alpha machine is broken or the Donald machine is broken. Right? Computer people,、uh, you'll see, tend to give、uh, their computers goofy names, though my laptop, as you've seen by contrast, is called Laptop.、Um, So, when you have multiple computers just to handle the sheer demand for your website, you don't want to advertise the names of all of those computers. You want to just present one unified face to the world, whether it's www.cnn.com or cnn.com. But as soon as you hit enter and your browser tries to visit this website, CNN's infrastructure routes you to one of those computers. And the computer it sends you to might be called www.1. .cnn.com, www.2.cnn.com. It's entirely the prerogative of the owners of that server, but for the most part, you, the user, don't ever see the host names of most of the computers that you're in effect being connected to when you visit a website or when you use some other internet based technology. So, www, host name, is the name of a computer, and a website doesn't necessarily have to have a host name associated with it. To summarize. But you also see addressing schemes like this, not just for websites, right? After web, what is the next most popular internet program you might use every day? Email is a big one. Well, email similarly makes use of domain names and TLDs and even what look like host names. But rather, if you send an email to mailin at fas.harvard. Edu. Well, here again is a TLD, edu instead of .com. Here's a domain name, and what did we say this is called? So this is a subdomain. So in the context of web addresses, you would usually call the first thing, if it's not the domain name itself, the host name. It's the name of the server that you're visiting. But really, when you send an email to someone, you really don't care what machine. That email is getting sent to, you care more conceptually that that email g o to the right domain. And so, in that sense, and it's a slight distinction, when you send an email to mailin at fas.harvard.edu, your email goes to whatever server it is on the internet that manages email for this domain, specifically this subdomain. Okay. So then I went to my original file. She wasn't there. But we have an alum whose email address, the first part before the domain name, is exactly the same as hers. And her domain is like AOL, and his is something completely different. Okay. I mean, they're not even close to domain name. But the front part is exactly the same. And I don't know what to do about it. So, it's a good question. And to summarize, it sounds like you have someone on one of your email lists that is receiving your emails but is complaining that they don't want to receive your emails. But that person's, the subdomain of that person's email address just so happens to be the same. What happens to be the same? The username? Only the username. And she's not on my list So, the, you have this user who wants to opt out of your email list because for some reason she's getting some emails. That are clearly meant for someone with a similar username but a different subdomain or domain name. So I can only hypothesize that either one, there's some kind of typo going on, a slight distinction, or perhaps more likely is one of the email addresses on your mailing list is forwarding to maybe her address, and maybe that person made a typo and are thus forwarding their emails to the wrong person. But without actually seeing the data, it's hard to be more accurate than that. If you want to send us an email, if you are allowed to reveal the details, we can try to advise. OK, a y we'll get that woman off your list soon enough. OK. a y Yes, that will be the challenge indeed. So, probably everyone in this room uses email at least once a day, or perhaps too frequently, more frequently than you would like. Well, some of these questions might seem pretty easy, but at the end of the day, these are perhaps common points of confusion, at least for neophytes. What does a typical email address look like? There are two canonical forms. If you have an email address, it probably looks like the first one, with just at domain.com, like david at gmail.com. Don't email that, it goes to some other David. 
or you can email some username at some subdomain dot domain dot tld. And you can have multiple subdomains, but after a while it starts to get ridiculous, and so you don't tend to see them that often. So these would perhaps be the two most basic forms. So a bit of a quiz. These are examples of legitimate email addresses. They might not go to real people, but syntactically, these are valid, syntactically correct email addresses. You know, frankly, these days on the internet, I bet one of these goes to every, there's probably someone that gets each of these emails. So maybe another at-home exercise. Email these people and see what kind of curious individuals you get back replies from. So those are valid email addresses. Points to take away are perhaps implicit. So clearly you can use letters of the alphabet. You can also use numbers. What other characters are clearly valid characters in an email address? Underscore? What kind of symbols? Symbols in general, too general. Be more specific. So underscores, which is that underbar, which creates the illusion of a space, but is just kind of a hack around it. What else is clearly valid? A hyphen is valid. Uh, in m it, uh, the m dash here, it's actually it would just be a hyphen in this case, but sure. A forward slash would not be valid in an email address. No slashes in email addresses ever. Uh, you, you clearly need the at sign. That's in both of the canonical forms we looked at. What do you not notice here? Well, there are not things like spaces. Spaces are not allowed. There are not things like dollar signs or what you might think of as weird characters. It's fairly safe to say that these are most of the valid symbols that can appear in an email address. But notice you can have a period. And it has different meaning to the left of the at and to the right of the at. To the right of the ad, it has some clear conceptual distinction. It's sort of a demarcation between the TLD and the domain and maybe a subdomain. On the left-hand side, it's completely arbitrary. People use dots sometimes in lieu of underscores just because they like the look better. But there's no inherent meaning. If it's David.Malin, that's just because David Malin thought the dot maybe looked better than no, no character at all, maybe better than an underscore. Harvard, arbitrarily, for those of you who are staff, arbitrarily chose to make email addresses of the form david underscore malin at harvard.edu, for instance. Capitalization, does it matter? It does not. It is tacky, dare say, to email someone with their address all capitalized. It's sort of silly if some people write their email addresses like d malin, if only because that's not really consistent with convention, but there's nothing wrong with it. Email addresses are case insensitive. You can capitalize, don't capitalize. It really doesn't matter, at least for this part of the domain name. But I have yet to meet a mail server that doesn't ignore capitalization in the username, though theoretically you could design a server that would make the distinction. But I wouldn't think on that too much. Quiz. Take a moment. Which of these are syntactically valid? It's always a good time for it. I know you can't see them. but. There you go. Which of these are syntactically valid? J at mvc.com. Oh, OK. We'll jump right into it. OK, J at mvc.com is, that's fine, is syntactically valid. We tried to throw you off with the capitalization, but completely legitimate. Uh, mine being mailing at post.harvard.edu. Good. Good. Somebody at franklin.ma.us. So that's an interesting point of discussion. If briefly, that looks like it's somebody from where? Yeah, Franklin, Massachusetts. So it turns out that in addition to TLDs like .org and .com and .gov, there are also two-character TLDs. And these are generally called country code TLDs. And we mentioned one earlier, even though it's sort of abused these days, but with permission. .tv is technically a country code. And it is a TLD, but it's, it was originally uh, under the um, control of just one country, and it is still, but they've allowed anyone to just use it. Even the US has their own TLD, .us, and a lot of um, uh, governmental entities like local townships, or if you have a city-oriented website, uh, the mayor's office, those sorts of domains, even though they could be in most any TLD, even .com if they wanted to, would just send a weird message, well, .us is common for municipalities and so forth. .ma.us is for Massachusetts, and Franklin.ma.us denotes Franklin, Massachusetts in the United States. But if we have .us, 
why do most websites in the United States seem to end in just dot com? Whereas if you go to CNN in the UK, you would instead visit something like CNN.co.uk or I think CNN.co.jp, if I'm remembering them correctly. So co, in a lot of countries, that's the convention they adopted. It just denotes commercial. They didn't choose com, but it was sort of arbitrary. But no, CNN's website in Japan, the one that brings up Japanese text, is not CNN.com. That seems to be the US one. In fact, you bring up most .coms, though that might be slight exaggeration these days. Many .coms, they pretty much look like English-based, United States-based websites. Why is it that the United States has this sort of luxury of not needing to use their country code all over the place? <laughs> And we were the first ones there. I mean, it's sort of what it boils down to. Who was the internet invented by? Not Al Gore. <laughs> Who, right, the, the internet grew out of what? A US military project, originally called ARPANET, Advanced Research Projects Association, if I'm getting the acronym right. So it was originally a military project that was designed, in, this, in effect, to allow computers, which at the time were huge and expensive and slow, to communicate throughout the country. It was designed in a way that allowed for redundancy, so that if one server or one city even were taken out, the rest of the network, in theory, could continue to function. And that's why today, and especially next week, we'll look at the interconnections that exist on the internet there's so many different ways to get from point A to point B. And it sort of looks like a mess, but that's a really good thing for dealing with problems. If servers go down, if connections break, and so forth, and that grows out of, to some extent, a military mentality, having redundancy, having the ability to withstand nodes or computers being taken offline for whatever reasons. Well, fast forward to today. Popularized the internet was by universities using it after that, and now typical people in the mid 90s and so forth. And so, for the most part, just the US happened to set most of this stuff up. Can you live in Japan or in the UK and have a dot com? Yes. yes. So, dot coms, dot orgs, dot nets, just as you, an American, or most of you Americans, can buy a dot com and use it here, so can most anyone. Else. So there really aren't restrictions on a lot of these TLDs these days. It's sort of broken down, um, partly for financial reasons, I'm sure. The bigger audience you have to sell to, the more money you can make, and partly just because networks are getting larger and more nebulously defined, so I'm sure you can cite other reasons for it. But know that doesn't necessarily mean that a website is here if it ends in .com anymore. It can end up anywhere. OK, back to the list at hand. Somebody is correct. Malin is correct. Jay is correct. What's wrong with the other three? Spacey and Daffy Duck, that one won't work. Dave at CBS is missing the ever important TLD. You don't need a subdomain, you do need a TLD. And finally, what's wrong with user? The exclamation point. All right, if it looks kind of funny, it's probably not legitimate these days. Periods, underscores, hyphens. Plus is valid, though it often has special meaning, and you don't see it in most normal people's email addresses. Netiquette, so goofy sort of word adopted years ago. What is netiquette all about? And this is very much related to, again, tonight's theme of the internet and the usage thereof, not necessarily the implementation thereof. What's netiquette? <laughs> yes, internet etiquette, right? Not hard to come up with that word. Do not, if you are new to email, or if you're not new to email but have been doing this for years, do not email people in all capital letters. Even if your caps lock key happens to be on by accident, take the time to turn it off and retype your message or at least be aware of what's appearing on your screen. Um, I, I don't do it now so much now that we film these lectures, but for years I would offer uh, family anecdotes of people in my family who would do these kinds of things. I'm not allowed to say who in my family to this day still does such things like this because oh, I didn't realize the caps lock key was down. Um, Considered bad netiquette. What does it imply if you receive an email in all capital letters? Shouting. That you're shouting. I mean, more likely these days, it's just you're not, you're a doofus. But it implies shouting. All right? Uh, related to uh, email usage is, of course, spam. For a while, we had to define what spam is. I think it goes without saying what spam is today. It is a huge, huge problem on the internet today to the extent that it uses up so much bandwidth. And you wouldn't think so based on the emails because they're pretty small usually, a few kilobytes, if even that, a couple paragraphs, maybe a small image attached. But 
you send out a million of those small emails and you do it all the time, or you send out 10 million of those emails, because at the end of the day, the marginal cost of sending one more email is pretty much zero cents. That's pretty good marketing technology. If you can, at nearly zero cost, spam thousands or millions of people, even if only 1% of those people are clueless enough as to click on the email or buy whatever it is you're spamming them with, 1% of a million, that's a lot of people. And it might be worth your while, especially if the cost of doing so wasn't even all that expensive. This is an example of spam. Those of you who are in debt might take heed from this particular email. You get all sorts these days about debt. Uh, Viagra, Cialis, uh, what are the other popular ones that you get every day? Porn. I'm sorry? Porn. Okay, porn is popular too. You get those as well. What else? Loans. Uh, for loans? The from Nigeria. Oh, yes, the Nigerian, was it the 409 scam? It has a name that refers to the part of the penal code that describes those kinds of scams. And you read every year, like an article will come up where there are people who have been duped by these things into losing tens of thousands of dollars or even their life savings. And um, spam, though, besides being a sort of a sociological problem for various reasons, it's also a technological one. Because what are you increasingly seeing in your spam? Or tell me about a typical spam. It probably doesn't always look like this these days. What do you often see if you scroll down farther? A bunch of addresses, perhaps. What else has perhaps confused you about spam you've received sometimes? OK, so it's often, it often has bogus return addresses, which is problematic because you don't know until you reply. And incidentally, before I forget, a lot of spam from non-legitimate companies will often include links or instructions, say, reply to this email with unsubscribe in the subject line to unsubscribe, or click this link to unsubscribe. Uh, if you learn nothing else tonight, know that you should never click links in spam to unsubscribe. Because what are you effectively doing by re replying to spam or clicking that unsubscribe link? All right, you're confirming to the spammer that, you know what, you just got a sucker there, and you're going to get more spam potentially because of it. It sounds like a nice idea to be able to opt out, but generally, if you inform the spammer proactively that, hey, I want out, what you're really saying is, hi, I exist. Because a lot of these emails, especially in domains like Hotmail and Gmail and Yahoo, the really popular domains, a clever spammer will just start to email randomly generated email addresses. Because if you have millions of customers, like Hotmail probably does, well, odds are that even if you guess a lot of them, some of them are going to actually be D-A-V-I-D or somewhat more cryptic, but nonetheless a valid email address. And so it's to a spammer's advantage if you proactively tell him or her, hey, you got a good one there. Yeah, in the back. That, that was kind of my question. How do they get this information uh, besides the randomness? Good question. How do spammers get email addresses? One is randomness. Two, if you go on E1's website, you can call at least two or three email addresses, mine, Ray's, the course email address. Anytime you publish an email address on a web page, if you um, are a spammer, you would use what's called a spider or a bot, which is just a program similar to what Google and reputable companies use to crawl the internet to index it for subsequent searching. But you can write a bot or a spider that just crawls the internet looking for email addresses. After all, you, the students, know that any email address is likely to be of one of these forms. Not hard to write a program that just looks for that pattern on a web page, grabs it, and then adds it to a spammer's database. So that's one other way as well. Yeah? Would, would it make sense if your name was, in, instead of putting your email address on a website, making, say, putting your name there, but having um, underneath that, once they click on it, contact you? Or um, if you have a hyperlink on the web page with which someone can email you, it's the same thing. Even if you don't see the email address, it's embedded in the so-called HTML, and a program can find it. You'll see a lot of websites will say, email me at Malin, and then it'll put a space or two. They might write at, and then they might say harvard.edu. Whether I would bet, you know, there's enough spammers in the world. Someone's probably taken the time to modify their program to also look for things of this format, which means they can figure out that you're just trying to trick them. What other websites will do, especially websites like the Facebook or a lot of these um, personals types websites where they might list your email address, they won't show your email address as text. They'll instead convert it to a JPEG or a GIF, that is an image. 
So an image isn't something that you can just sort of highlight like you can with Microsoft Word. You would have to figure out what that image is actually representing. It's similar in spirit to、um, if you've ever visited those websites, and in order to confirm, you have to type in that cryptic, the squiggly words and numbers, which sometimes are too squiggly to even understand correctly. Same idea. The idea with those is that it's hard for a computer to figure that out. Similarly, if you show the email address as an image, it's marginally harder for a computer to figure that out, or at least it takes more CPU cycles to process that kind of thing. Personally. I don't care anymore about posting my email address everywhere on the internet. I actually think that there is a technological solution to this problem, and that though it's very reasonable to say, it, though it's very reasonable to assume that you will you will get less spam if you don't publish your email address in printed forms or on web pages. That's a hard thing to prevent all of the time, especially if you want to keep an email address for years. It only takes once or twice for it to get slurped somehow, and then just get propagated through databases. And anti-spam software is definitely getting better. I mean, I get probably 500 to 1,000 total emails a day, many of which are spam. 200 of which tend to be real emails. And among those 200 real emails that actually I see in my inbox, I would say on a typical day. I get four to six spams these days, and I actually think that's pretty good. I'm rarely having to delete them. So in short, e- spam detection is getting better, but the fundamental problem is that email was not designed correctly to deal with this problem. There is no security implemented in email, and the fact that spam is such a problem is because there was no forethought given, or at least、um, oh, implemented. There was no.、Uh, this was not. Raised as an important issue initially, and that's partly because no one saw, or many people didn't see, the internet becoming used by people like you and me. Like, who's going to want to email a few hundred researchers who are using the internet for research purposes? So that's part of it as well.、Uh, another example of spam: if you're、uh, finding e1 a little too much work, you can call the number on your screen or wait for this spam to arrive, and you can cash out with your degree much more quickly than any kind of university program. And there's a whole bunch of others these days. Only so that we can slap another piece of jargon on it. What is an emoticon without looking down at your papers? It's a smiley face. So this is a non-exhaustive list of the emoticons that people have not only come up with a word for, but also、um, all of the different emotions that they might express. The only one that we like to point out each, each year is somewhat apropos. Is <laughs> one of them's funny. <laughs> this one too is kind of funny, only because here we are tonight. So、uh, feel free to assert any of those as your own in future emails. Okay, so let's do this. Let's pause for five minutes so I can turn your attention to one of the white pieces of paper tonight. This is a survey. The course, as you know, offers sections and workshops. One, we would like to just get some feedback from you now for no more than five minutes on what you think of the course, what you think of the lectures, but most importantly, to be honest, why you are or are not going to sections or workshops. Just to give you the historical perspective, when I was a TF for this course years ago. We had three or four sections of 15 or 20 students, and 15 or 20 students were attending each night. And we'd like to think that we're not just doing a bad job these days, but that there's more interesting issues involved as to why students in the class tend not to be as interested in the course's sections and workshops anymore. Perhaps it's more savvy. Perhaps it's because of scheduling. But if you could just give us your candid thoughts, don't put your name on them. It's not necessary. We would love to understand what you like and don't like, and what's driving you to come or not come. These things. I'll even put on a bit of、uh, background music. So t- uh, this week's section is going to be on exploring the internet.、Uh, this week and next week in lecture, David goes kind of fe- quickly through uh, uh, the internet and how things work, and we're going to take a little time to explore things、um, both a little bit deeper for those、uh, who who feel comfortable with the pace at which David is going. And、uh, take a, a, a breather to, to review some things、uh, that he's already covered.、Uh, for those of you who'd like to go, what?、Um, so we're going to explore the internet, talk about how email works, talk a little bit more about how web servers work, that sort of thing. Okay. And this Saturday's workshop will be led by Dan. Hi everyone. This Saturday we'll have a workshop on、uh, the Mac OS. And I invite I invite all of you to come. Doesn't matter if you have never seen a Mac before, or if you think you are、uh, quite a bit savvy. I guarantee you'll learn something.、Uh, we'll talk about the Mac OS itself. We'll talk a little bit about、uh, Apple, the
the company. We'll talk about the Intel switch. We'll answer any questions you have, basic troubleshooting. There's a lot that we're going to cram into two hours. So I hope to see all of you there. Okay, fantastic. And finally, this Sunday, we have a back-to-back -back workshop. Dan's is on Saturday. On Sunday at 11 a.m., we will all meet, if you are interested, at the Kendall Square, Kendall Square Tea Stop for a field trip of sorts to MIT Swap Fest. This is something that happens every month or so up until the month between, I think, April and October. We'll post a link to more details on the course's website on the lectures page. But the short of it is that this is a wonderfully fun, low-key uh, afternoon where you see a lot of crazy guys who have a whole bunch of stuff in their basements and garages and vans that they drive up to a lot at MIT with and every month um, have stuff to give away, to sell, and we're talking old electronics, old computer parts. Really interesting because you can ask questions of these types of folks who really know their stuff on things about radios and computers and other types of systems. So if you're at all a geek or you'd like to take a stroll through uh, yesteryear's hardware and just have a good time and we'll all grab lunch or something afterward, um, do feel free to attend. We'll do RSVPs over email just so we know how many to expect roughly, but question one on this survey is just about whether you think you would join us this Sunday at 11 a.m. and you'd be welcome to bring uh, dates as before, uh, family and friends and so forth. Um, turns out that problem set three, which was distributed this evening, is due this evening. In fact, an hour and a half ago. So that's my fault. Um, per the syllabus, this is actually due on Wednesday, 25 October. So you have two weeks, not T minus 1.5 hours, to do it. So my apologies. We'll update that on the website for problem set three, which was just handed out tonight. So there's just a couple other things that are in the slides. I'm going to skip over SSH and SFTP because we'll come back to that. But just so that we tie, wrap up this discussion, and I want to conclude with a really neat demo, Let's uh, look at the ever enlightening slide on the World Wide Web. So what is the World Wide Web? So the network of all networks. So the answer to that is actually no. And this is where you can make a subtle but useful distinction. The web or the World Wide Web and the internet, they are not the same thing. So what you just described actually was a perfect definition of the internet, a network of networks. But the internet is really an infrastructure, something that takes physical form and is the physical incarnation of is what we've described as the network of networks of networks. It's sort of the, the backbone on which a whole bunch of neat services run. And the World Wide Web is an example of such a service. It's something that you can do with the internet, something on the internet. And I would liken it to other internet-based services like email and instant messaging and podcasting. These are sort of higher level programs, if you will, or services that you do using the internet. But the internet itself is really that uh, infrastructure underneath the hood. A URL is something that you probably have typed every day. Uh, here's another, uh, I won't name names within the family. Do not call this an URL. Um, it's really difficult to keep a straight face when someone in your family is asking you to pull up the URL, www.cnn.com. It's a URL, Uniform Resource Locator. You don't have to know that, but know to say URL, even though it's the more inefficient way of saying it. The canonical form is this. And we'll see other incarnations of this. But when you see something, colon, slash, slash, something, pretty much refers to a URL. And even though you, a typical user, might only see things that are HTTP, colon, slash, slash, something, it turns out that you can have URLs of other formats for other types of services, most of which typical users don't use, but one of which you will use later in the course, namely SSH or even SFTP can be written in this way. But more on that in the future. Some examples. All of these are valid URLs. These are all valid addresses of servers. So essentially, a URL, even though you almost always see it just for the web, it's really a general way of describing the protocol that you must use to talk to a machine. A protocol, as suggested up there, is just the language that your computer needs to use to access the service. So when you, the user, use Internet Explorer to pull up CNN.com, the language that your computer and that server are using to communicate is called HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. 
or transfer protocol. This is just a, you know, it's like English is to us. We have a way of communicating with each other via the standards known as English. Computers, specifically web browsers and web servers, have their own language called HTTP that they use to speak back and forth to one another. Think of it as the language that you might have to use to order meals in a foreign restaurant with a foreign waiter. And meanwhile, underneath that is HTML, which we will come back to on our website class. Um, HTML, by contrast, is the language that web pages are written in. So whereas you might speak French in a French restaurant to the waiter, if you were to hand him a note, or rather if you were to, uh, this analogy is very quickly going to break down. Let's not even try to use an analogy and focus tonight just on HTTP, which is the language that web browsers and web servers use to communicate, and leave it at that. So some examples of protocols and sites that one can visit are these. Foo.com, foo.com, with, uh, with or without the host name, capitalization you see in the third row, doesn't seem to matter. You can have slashes in URLs. And in fact, when you see a slash, it's usually because you have something like the uh, example. Ah, look at that. None of these actually have the example. If you have something like uh, HTTP colon slash slash foo dot com slash bar slash index dot html, especially if you're a PC user, you've seen things that look like this. But you've probably seen things like C colon backslash program files and so forth. So these are both just paths. They tell you where something is on the internet, just like this tells you where something is on your hard drive. Use the language HTTP to access this information. The server is called foo.com. That's also the domain name. But again, you don't necessarily need a host name. It's up to the server administrators. This is take a guess. What does this represent? Think about what this is. This is just a folder on that web server. This is just a file in that folder. And as you'll see, when you start making web pages in this class, you will be creating text files called something.html. And in that file will you write your web page. You can put it in a folder in your domain. So it could be davidmalin.com slash something slash mypage.html, but the only reason you would use folders is just for the reason you would use them on a local computer, just to keep things neat and tidy and organized. That's really the only reason. But notice this. You can visit, I'll do it anyway, you can visit cnn.com. Let's hope nothing bad has happened. If you visit, uh, oh well, can't win. If you visit not just CNN.com, notice, and it's going to be small text, CNN.com slash index.html. Really have to pick a new demo for next year, like yesterday's news. Index.html tends to be the default name for most home pages. So even though you don't always have to type it, because in the absence of specifying what file you want, a web server will usually give you some default file name which happens to be, as you see here, index.html. But more on that in our internet. Actually, I'm going to close the headline so we get back to this. So with that said, and we'll focus um, just on a couple of these before our final demo, which of these are syntactically valid is the first one. No, slashes are in the wrong direction. Here's another uh, way to make sure that tech people don't laugh at you behind your back. This is a forward slash. This is a backslash. Do not confuse them. It's a silly semantic thing, but if you start calling forward slashes backslashes and backslashes forward slashes, the person, if they are a technophile you're talking to, you're going to lose some credibility very quickly. Um, and I actually have an example photo that I'll bring in next time. What you also don't want to do is make mistakes, not even verbally or semantically, but when I was home in Connecticut once, I went with my mom to Bed Bath & Beyond, and they had in their window a really big and probably expensive poster advertising their new website as bed, bath, and I think I got that backwards, beyond.com. Right? It's probably $200, $500 sign in their window advertising their website. Visit us at www.bedbathandbeyond.com. That is bad marketing. That is not a valid URL. You type that into a web browser, you will not go to Bed Bath & Beyond. This obvious reason perhaps being what character is not allowed in URLs? 
the ampersand. And I don't know what marketing genius got this wrong. When you are advertising your company, best to advertise the correct URL. That will not work. It was, in fact, A and D that they meant to write. So funny thing. So again, there too. If you sort of next time you walk into Bed Bath and Beyond, uh, you know, just smile to yourself if the ad still happens to be up, and try to explain to the manager why it should really come down. Because frankly, it, we sort of make fun of it. But a stupid little thing like that. If you are an uninformed user and you say, "All right, Bed Bath and Beyond," you pull this up, doesn't work. You know, that's bad business. You're probably not going to go back, or at least for a while. So sales might be lost. Um, middle one, uh, the second one, www.bar.com. So this is sort of a trick question. It's not officially a URL because it's missing the protocol specification, but it turns out these days you don't need to type it, at least in a browser. Technically, when you visit a web page like we just did with CNN, you're visiting a URL. But most of us probably don't bother typing HTTP colon slash slash anymore because you just don't need to. Browsers, if you don't specify a protocol, assume that you want HTTP, because after all, you're using a browser in the first place. But it turns out there are other types of URLs. FTP is another protocol, file transfer protocol. You'll use this later in the term. But that's just a program with which, whose sole purpose in life is to let you copy files from your computer to some remote server. And you would access that via FTP colon slash slash. But this last one, not valid. Why is it not valid? Wrong slash. So one slash rather than two actual slashes. Um, what I will do, we'll keep a couple of the remaining things for next time. But in the remaining two minutes, I just wanted to wow you if you've never used this before. So let's very quickly, uh, when you've had to look up directions, where, what websites do you tend to use these days? OK, I heard Google Maps, and I heard MapQuest. So I, Google Maps tends to be the best, not necessarily in terms of the directions they provide, but just in the aesthetics. The maps, I would say, subjectively look so much better than MapQuest or Yahoo's ever did. And that's enough reason, I think, to try this site out. If we search for 1 Oxford Street in Cambridge, Mass 02138, if you've never used a website like this before, the beautiful thing about Google Maps, like these other sites, is it whips, whisks you right away to it. and then. You can scroll around. You can zoom in. These days, you can actually click satellite and actually get a satellite version of the same area. And this is literally going to be a 60-second teaser. If you think things like this are cool, the note I'd like us to end on tonight is another one of these applications, these services. We talked initially tonight about networks and the internet, and then a couple services on top of it, the most popular perhaps, email and um, the web. And we used Victor as an example of using Skype. VoIP, Voice over IP, is another program. Well, if you download, and this is more of a software product than a specific service, if you like this sort of thing, download, and we'll provide a link to it, Google Earth, which is software that Google actually bought from another company. I spent two hours this afternoon preparing for a lecture, looking up with this program. For one thing, we can type in again the Science Center. OK, that was helpful. Uh, there we go. If you can see that. Oh, wait, is that going to work? Come on. Oh, too big. Let's go back to this view. Come on. Here we go. Where is the Science Center on Earth? So when you can zoom in even for, and I, I swear to God, this whole lecture would have been about this program had we started with it and not ended with it. This was my way of self-regulating. So here's the Harvard Science Center. You are roughly over here in the building where my cursor is. You know, Cambridge, Massachusetts might be fine and all, but let's just for the sake of it zoom on over to, oh, how about Venice? This is just a brilliant interface and the coolest thing I've seen today, frankly. And here we are in Venice. I was taking a little vacation in my apartment this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Venice. You can zoom out, and I'll leave you to play with it. Like you can change angles. And the software sort of interpolates. Things will look very flat, which is not what Venice looks like. It is sinking, but it's not entirely flat. But the software, and this is an example of really neat tricks with fast processors, is giving you different perspectives based on its inference of what the landscape looks like. All right, Italy's interesting. Let's zip on over to New York. 
And again, we'll provide you with a link to this on the website. It's entirely free. It takes a couple minutes to download. You install it. It's a wonderful way of spending time in the middle of the day, or frankly, with kids, too. I think we get a real kick out of this. And the reason, actually, I brought this up this afternoon is I'm auditing an archaeology course at the college this semester. And the professor, for the first time today, used this as an example of showing us um, the pyramids of Giza, the, oh, wait, I got one last cool one. Oh, here we go. The Great Sphinx. And the photography, the aerial photography and satellite imagery isn't perfect, right? You can't totally zoom in and see things like you could on the ground. But my God, from an apartment in Boston to be able to take, being able to take this virtual tour of the world with such a neat, clean interface, there you see it, um, is the Great Sphinx. So on that wow factor, why don't we call it a night and we'll see you next week. <laughs>